So now we're going to complete the proof for this quadratic limit. Um, before we do, though, I actually want to go back to the graph. There's one step in this proof that always freaks people out the first time that they see it. Um, and I think it makes sense if you if you look and think about the what is the logical argument that we're trying to make using the graph first. Because once you accept that the logical argument makes sense, then when you see it algebraically, it'll be familiar and it won't freak you out so much. So where we were last time is we had this x squared function, and we're trying to show that the limit of x squared as x approaches 2 is equal to 4. Um, and just by playing around, just by experimenting, I saw that it looks like that as long as you set the delta window equal to one-fifth the size of the epsilon window, all of the x values that were, are within a delta distance of 2 will map to be within an epsilon distance of 4. And remember, that's what we're trying to show. We're imagining as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, we can provide a delta that will make that happen. So I said last time, this doesn't prove anything. We're just playing around. But it certainly looks like that is going to be true um, as, long as, as long as epsilon is small enough. Here's the part in the proof that freaks people out. We're, we're going to prove in a second that this epsilon over 5 actually does work. Um, however, if my epsilon gets large enough, aha, so once my epsilon gets really big, it looks like setting my delta equal to epsilon over 5 is no longer going to work anymore. Um, there's no mystery, though, about what you can do once epsilon gets so large. Because remember, the goal is to respond to the challenge. If somebody gives me an epsilon, I can always give them a delta so that my delta so that all the x values within my delta neighborhood map within the epsilon neighborhood of the limit. So if my epsilon is so so big that my that the delta window becomes very large if we're setting delta to be epsilon over 5, there's a very easy answer here. We'll just say in the case that the epsilon of the challenge is small, let's say that our delta is going to be epsilon over 5. In the case that the epsilon is so big that that doesn't work, let's just set delta to be equal to 1, because we know that that's a value of delta that's going to be small enough, provided the epsilon window is that large. So that's not logically weird, because we're allowed to set delta to be whatever we want, and we just made a rule. We said if if the epsilon window is small, we'll set delta to be epsilon over 5. If the epsilon window is big, we'll set it to be something smaller than that so that we know it still works. So convince yourself that that argument makes sense. And that's what I want you to keep in mind as we go into this proof. Let's start by doing some scratch work that is not the proof. Um, we'll start by working backwards from what we want to be true so that we can decide what do we need to set this delta to be so that the thing that we wish were true actually is true? So I'm going to rewrite this distance here of f of x away from 4. I'm going to rewrite that distance as x plus 2 times x minus 2. And when someone gives me an epsilon, my goal is to find a delta so that, so that this quantity is going to be smaller than epsilon. All right. The key to understanding this is to remember what we have control over. The very first step of our proof is going to be setting delta equal to something, which is the same thing as setting the range of x values that we claim will map inside a certain window around the limit. So we're allowed to say we think that as long as the distance of x away from 2 is smaller than, than this thing, then all of the f of x values are going to be close enough to the limit. All right, so we're allowed to set the size of x minus 2. So we're allowed to set the size of this thing. So remember, if we're responding to this challenge, we wish it were true that this is smaller than epsilon. That's the same thing as saying we wish it were true that this is smaller than epsilon. And this bracketed part right here, we can set the size of that directly by setting our delta. So if it weren't for this pesky thing, we'd be done already. If somebody says, uh, hey, can you make this thing less than an epsilon of 1 tenth? The answer is absolutely. Let's just set delta equal to 1 tenth. That means we know that this quantity is smaller than delta. 
which immediately implies that that quantity is smaller than epsilon because you just set your delta to be equal to whatever the epsilon is supposed to be. So if it weren't for the thing under my finger, this would have worked. So here's the strategy. The strategy is let's find an upper bound for this thing in the, in the bubble. So what does an upper bound mean? An upper bound means like, let's find a number so that we can be sure that this quantity is never larger than that number. Here comes the part that you're going to think is weird. Let's just provisionally say, what if delta is going to be less than or equal to one? Because remember, we're allowed to set delta to whatever we want. So let's just say that, um, let's just look at the cases where delta is smaller than or equal to one. And we can think about what happens if delta is larger than one in a minute. So if delta is larger than one, remember what that's really saying. That's saying that all the x values have to be within a distance of one away from two. So you, we can do this algebraically as follows. Um, if delta is less than or equal to one, we can plug in that value for delta. So we're saying, absolute value x minus two is less than delta, which is the same thing as one, so it's less than one. Um, that, of course, is the same thing as saying x minus two is between negative one and positive one. And if we add two, that gives us that x is between one and three. And that should have been completely obvious if you think about the meaning of the absolute value, because we're saying that all the x values have to be within a distance of one of two, and what that means is if you think about what is a distance of one away from two, that's between one and three. So you didn't even need to like do this algebra. Like it, it just makes perfectly logical sense if you think about it. But there we have it. So what we've done so far is we've decided that if delta is less than or equal to one, then we've restricted the range where x could possibly appear. x has got to be in there somewhere. And if x has got to be in there somewhere, Let's add two everywhere in this inequality. That also means that x plus two has to be between three and five. So if delta is less than or equal to one, we know that this number can't possibly be larger than five because by setting delta, we've restricted where x could be. And by restricting where x could be, we've also restricted what could this thing possibly be. So what we know is that that thing is less than five, remembering that that's only true as long as delta is small enough. So if that's true, then we have a new value that we can set delta to that we know is going to work. So I know that x plus two times x minus two is going to be smaller than five times x minus, uh, sorry, five, wait, what am I doing? Yep, x minus two. So I know that this quantity is going to be smaller than that quantity, remember, as long as delta is small enough. And the reason why is because this part is never going to, this, this part is always smaller than five. So since this part's the same in both equations, um, I know that that's true. So given that, if that's going to be smaller than epsilon, which is what I want, then that gives me a way of knowing what should I set this to be smaller than? Because remember, that's what I have control over. I'm allowed to say how small is that thing. So if I set x, if I set absolute value x minus two to be smaller than epsilon over five, then I'm sure that the thing that I wish were true will actually be true. Okay, so, so I think, remember, this is all scratch work. This is not the proof. But I think that if I set delta equal to epsilon over 5, then it's going to work. And that's consistent with all that experimenting we were doing earlier. So this is not the proof. We were working backwards to figure out what is a value of delta that's going to work. So let's actually do it all forwards now to actually complete the proof and show that it actually will work. So clear your mind. We haven't done any of this. This doesn't exist. We're starting completely fresh. And we're going to prove that given some epsilon, any epsilon, not just one tenth, given some epsilon, we're going to provide a value for delta so that if x is within that neighborhood of 2, then y will be within an epsilon neighborhood of 4. All right, so the first step of the proof is let's set delta equal to epsilon over five, which is the value that we think is going to work.
And then we're going to work step by step forward from this thing to show that if this is true, then that is true. All right, so let's work forward. Since delta equals epsilon over 5, I'm going to just plug it in up here. So I know that the this distance is going to be less than epsilon over 5. All right, let's multiply both sides by 5. So now I've got 5 times x minus 2 is less than epsilon. Now the next step I'm going to do has a restriction on it. So I'm going to write it down, and then we'll remember the restriction. So we know that this is true. And we also know that as long as delta is less than or equal to 1, that quantity is larger than this quantity. And we know that because we worked it out over here. OK, and remember that this step is only true provided that delta is less than or equal to 1. OK, so we'll come back to the other case. What if delta is larger than 1? We'll come back to that in a minute. So assuming that this is true, now we can just take the very left-hand side and the very right-hand side. And we know that this quantity has to be less than epsilon. So we've got x plus 2 times x minus 2 is less than epsilon. Now we just rewrite this. So we've got x squared minus 4 is less than epsilon. And that's what we were trying to show is true. So we started with what we had control over. How big is that delta neighborhood? And we worked step by step using only true statements until we got to the thing that we were trying to prove, that the f of x values are fit within the epsilon neighborhood of 4. If you'd like, you could actually reproduce all of the work that justifies this step. So if delta is less than or equal to 1, then we know that this uh, distance is less than 1. And this is all the same stuff that we did before. Um, and notice, we're not working backwards here. We're not assuming that this is true at any step in the argument. The only thing that we're assuming is that delta is less than or equal to 1. And we'll, we're not even assuming that, because in just a second, we'll look at what happens if delta is larger than 1. Um, but I just want to, to reassure you that just because we worked backwards to start with, if you look at the actual proof, we never assume the thing that we're trying to prove. We're always working forwards from our choice of delta. So let's look at where we are. Um, when we started out, we had this graph. And it appeared from the graph as if no matter what epsilon was, setting delta to be equal to epsilon over 5 was going to produce a window that was small enough that all of the x values would map inside that epsilon neighborhood. Um, and now we've proved algebraically that that's true. Or at least we've proved algebraically that that's true as long as we assume that delta is less than or equal to 1. So let's look again. What, what would cause delta to be larger than 1? Well, we're setting delta to be epsilon over 5. So delta is only going to be larger than 1 if epsilon gets super big. So if we make epsilon equal to, it's approaching 5, not quite 5, almost 5. OK, so there, as soon as epsilon is larger than 5, then our delta value, which is epsilon over 5, is slightly larger than 1. And that's where the key step in our argument stopped being true. Um, and so we see that it stops working here. Now, remember what I told you back at the very beginning of the video. I said that the whole goal here is if someone gives us an epsilon, we need to give a delta so that all of the x values within a delta neighborhood map within the epsilon neighborhood. We've done that as long as epsilon is small enough. As long as the epsilon window doesn't get so big that delta is larger than 1, our argument works. Well, what should we do in the case that epsilon is large enough that our delta is too big for our argument. Well, in that case, we don't need some kind of clever, fancy argument. The only, the only time our argument breaks down is when epsilon is huge. And when epsilon is huge, we can just say, look, uh, don't set delta equal to epsilon over 5 anymore. Let's just set delta equal to 1. Um, because we know we've already figured out that that's going to work. So that's, that's the logic of the argument. Let's look at how you write that down algebraically now. Instead of setting delta equal to epsilon over 5, we know that that's not always going to work. In particular, we know that that fails whenever epsilon over 5 is larger than 1. 
So instead, let's do this. Let's set some conditions. I'd said like, if if delta is smaller than one, we're okay. We'll keep it at epsilon over five. If delta is larger than one, then we'll set it back to be equal to one. A different way of saying that is let's set delta to be the minimum of epsilon over five and one. So in that case, if epsilon is small enough so that epsilon over five is less than one, then we'll end up setting delta equal to that value that we know is gonna work because of this proof. Okay, what if epsilon is so big that epsilon over five is bigger than one? In that case, we're gonna set delta to the minimum of these two values. We know that epsilon was so big that this is bigger than one, so instead of that, we're gonna set it to one instead. And we know that that should work because we have already figured out that it would work, but let's sort of just, like I said, algebraically show how we'd write that. So I'm gonna do a sort of parallel proof right over here. So in this case, we're imagining what if epsilon is so big that, so like epsilon's bigger than five, so that would mean that if delta were to be epsilon over five, that would mean that delta was larger than one. So in that case, we wouldn't set it to be epsilon over five. In this case, we would set delta equal to one instead. And let's do the proof in the same way. So we're starting over here. We're saying we're setting delta equal to one. So absolute value x minus two is less than one. Notice though that one is smaller than epsilon over five because the only thing that would cause us to choose this choice was if our epsilon was huge. It was epsilon being large that caused one to be smaller, which is what caused us to choose one. So if that's true, I can just immediately write absolute value x minus two is less than epsilon over five. And notice this is actually the exact same thing we started with on this side. So now the rest of the proof proceeds exactly the same way. Every single step along the way is going to be the same, including this, this mystery step. The, well, it's not a mystery step, but this step that is maybe new to you. This step we said was only valid if delta is less than or equal to one. In this case, our value for delta is epsilon over five, where epsilon is really small. So in, in this case, that's true. In this case, where epsilon over five was gonna produce a value that was too large, we changed our minds and said, let's set delta to be small enough that we know it's gonna work. So because we set delta equal to one, that's why we can still do this step because we still know that it's gonna work. So that might feel like magic to you because like, how does it magically work out the same in both cases? But I would encourage you to go back and think about that graph. It's not magic, it's just a very, very simple argument. We worked out that, whoops, we worked out that as long as epsilon is small enough, epsilon over five is a delta value that will work. And if epsilon's too big, then we'll just set delta to be small enough that we know it's gonna work. We'll just set delta equal to one. So of course you would expect the proof to be the same in both cases because we just made a choice that if, delta, if epsilon's so large, our proof wouldn't work, let's make delta small enough so that our proof still works. And that's not bad because the whole goal of this thing is we have to show that we can respond to the challenge of choosing a delta no matter what epsilon is. So really we just thought about it logically and chose a delta that we knew would work. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So I hope that this has been a little bit slower and clearer. I admit that it's kind of weird to think about the first time, a couple of times you go through it, but the more you the more you really try and translate all of this epsilon delta stuff into an intuition about we're given this and we're trying to come up with this and these absolute values are really just describing distances. If you really translate all the steps into that, I think it makes a lot of intuitive sense.